on December the 10th of 2022, Wisconsin woman Shantanae Walton, who was at the time in her mid-twenties, was driving a 1993 Toyota Camry through Milwaukee. The woman's cousin, 31-year-old Deanna Edwards, was a passenger in the vehicle. At some point during the drive, Walton sped into a tree at the intersection of 91st Street and Bradley Road. Mother of four, Edwards, was killed in the crash, while Walton, who appeared to be severely intoxicated, was taken to a local hospital. Her blood alcohol content was found to be 0.223, nearly three times the legal limit, while the presence of THC, the active component in marijuana, was also detected in her system. Assistant District Attorney Ian F. Vance Curzon would later describe Walton as a danger to society, stating that she shouldn't have been driving at all. In 2018, she was convicted of operating a vehicle without a license in Waukesha and was additionally found guilty of operating a vehicle with a suspended license in 2021 in Brookfield Municipal Court. In the summer of 2023, eight months after she'd posted her $10,000 bond for the Edwards case, Walton was involved in another serious accident at 91st and Mill Road. I just remember turning, victim Ganeen Davis later told a media outlet, adding, I didn't see her coming. Walton slammed her vehicle into Davis's, flipping it on its side before fleeing the scene. Davis, her son, and a third person in the vehicle survived but suffered various wounds including broken bones and spinal injuries. Walton was arrested a few days later. For the crash that led to her cousin's death, Walton pleaded guilty to homicide by intoxicated use of vehicle and knowingly operating a vehicle without a valid license in October of 2023. In March of the following year, she received consecutive sentences total in 10 years for the accident of which she'd been responsible while on bail. Walton pleaded not guilty. Her charges included knowingly operating a car without a license, causing great bodily harm, hit and run involving great bodily harm, and bail jumping. Number 9. Adam Benefield New York woman Kiera Benefield was viciously assaulted by her estranged husband, Adam, in their Buffalo home on September the 28th of 2022. The mother of three posted the home surveillance footage to her Facebook a day later. The clip showed 45-year-old ex-con Adam tackling her to the ground and punching her relentlessly. He was arrested in the aftermath. Kiera told law enforcement that she thought she was going to die during the attack and that Adam had threatened to kill her. According to 30-year-old Kiera's statements, the argument had erupted after she'd learned that her husband had beaten their daughter and left her outside the home. The woman recounted that during the onslaught that followed, her husband hit her anywhere he could, ripped off her pants and stuck his hand in her privates before pacing around the room with a knife in hand. Adam's sister, Rachel, lived in an apartment upstairs and she heard Kiera's cries for help. Adam answered the door for his sister but told her he wasn't done with Kiera and that she wasn't getting out of there alive. Rachel called the police and he was taken into custody. In spite of the video evidence, the victim's harrowing report and Adam's criminal past, he was only charged with misdemeanors, including third-degree assault, fourth-degree criminal mischief, second-degree menacing and second-degree unlawful imprisonment. The low-level charges enabled his release on October the 4th. Kiera expected her husband to come for her and wore a bulletproof vest when she went to drop off her children to school. At some point during the drive, Adam ambushed Kiera by ramming his car into hers. Adam then executed his wife in cold blood with a shotgun. Roughly 24 hours after his release from custody, the gunman fled in the aftermath. The children were unhurt but found covered in blood in the back seat. Adam was located via a tip from the public and arrested for murder. On October the 12th, Tammy Hudson, Kiera's mother, later spoke to the media to say that New York Governor Kathy Hochul was just as responsible for her daughter's death as the gunman. Hochul had repeatedly expressed support for no cash bail, which she claimed 
would close racial and class disparities within the justice system. Hudson was quoted as saying of Hochul, she failed me, she let me down and my daughter down and she needs to make a change with the bail reform. Number eight, Marcus Osborne. Leading up to April of 2023, English woman Katie Higton had been in a relationship with 35-year-old Marcus Osborne for five years. When the latter assaulted Higton on April the 28th, the woman deemed the attack as the last straw in a campaign of violence to which her boyfriend had subjected her. She left him and then went to a Huddersfield police station to report him on May the 10th. Higton revealed that in the last two years of the relationship, she'd been regularly beaten by Osborne, recounting one particularly disturbing incident in which the man had thrown a cat at her. 27-year-old Higton told the police that Osborne had threatened to slit her throat if she said what he had done and that if she ever got a boyfriend, he would kill them both. The man had been convicted of violence towards two previous partners in 2011 and 2012. Based on Higton's report, he was arrested on suspicion of domestic violence on May the 12th and bailed out on the condition that he stayed away from the home he'd shared with her in the days that followed. Osborne spied on his ex and hacked her Snapchat, thus learning that she was dating 25-year-old Steve Harnett. On May the 15th, Osborne went to Hickton's home at Harp Inge in Dalton and forced his way inside. Armed with a knife, he held another woman at the home captive as he waited for his ex to return from a cinema date with Harnett. Moments after Higton stepped through the door, Osborne ambushed her and unleashed a stabbing frenzy. The victim reportedly tried to fight back but was ultimately overpowered. Osborne killed her by inflicting 99 knife injuries, 26 of which were to the woman's face, as he, fueled by jealous rage, intended to disfigure her. He then used the victim's phone and pretended he was her in order to lure Harnett inside. Osborne murdered and mutilated him as well, delivering 26 knife strikes. He moved the bodies so that they were lined up side by side and remained in the home for several hours. During that time, he held the captive woman at knife point and abused her. Prior to fleeing the scene, Osborne invited a neighbor inside and showed him the butchered bodies of Higton and Harnett as he was reportedly proud of what he'd done. The deranged killer subsequently surrendered to law enforcement and later on pleaded guilty to two counts of murder and to the charges that stemmed from him forcing himself on the surviving victim. Updates from March of 2024 indicated that he was handed a whole life order at Leeds Crown Court. The sentence, which was really handed in the UK and reserved for those committing the most heinous crimes, meant that Osborne would die behind bars. Standing outside the courthouse, Harnett's twin, Jordan, stated that West Yorkshire police had failed the victims. Jordan asked, how is a man with a history of domestic violence allowed to walk freely from a police station just a couple of days prior to him murdering my brother and his girlfriend? Number seven, Rashawn Gaston Anderson. The Bail Project, a celebrity-endorsed non-profit organization who helped secure bail for people financially unable to do so, announced that it was closing down its Las Vegas chapter in December of 2022. The decision was partly based on a November 2021 case involving 24-year-old Rashawn Gaston Anderson, a repeat offender who had previously been diagnosed with schizophrenia. On November the 8th, he was arrested for pandering and carrying a concealed weapon. He was released without bail and ordered to stay out of further trouble and to keep his distance from the Las Vegas Strip. The very next day, however, Gaston Anderson was taken into custody for burglary and theft. The bail project secured the $3,000 bond set by Las Vegas Justice Court Judge Amy Kellini. Less than a week later, on December the 20th, Gaston Anderson walked into the Shanghai Taste Restaurant on Spring Mountain Road with a firearm in hand. He approached waiter Cheng Yan Wang as he was mopping the floor and demanded money. In the moments that followed, Gaston Anderson opened fire, shooting the worker seven times. Wang 
miraculously survived and underwent rehabilitation for his injuries which included bullet wounds to the stomach and lung. He later sued the bail project, alleging the group hadn't done their due diligence in determining whether Rashawn Gaston Anderson would be a danger to the community and likely re-offend. After the shooting, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department revealed a surveillance photo of Gaston Anderson which showed the man with a hood up while wearing dark sunglasses and a face mask on his chin. He was arrested a week later at a Las Vegas area mental health facility and in late October of 2022 pleaded guilty to attempted robbery with a deadly weapon and mayhem with use of a deadly weapon. The pleas resulted in a sentence of 7 to 18 years in prison. Prior to admitting guilt, Gaston Anderson had noted that the bail project had offered no support for his mental health issues after securing his bail. In the spring of 2020, Kendall Abel was arrested on domestic battery charges after his fiance had accused him of beating her with a hammer inside their home in Indianapolis, Indiana. The brutal assault reportedly left the victim, 29-year-old Ashley Richardson, with several bruises down her back and arms as well as lacerations to her head. In the incident's wake, Richardson filed a restraining order against her attacker, who posted bail and was released from custody after just a couple of days. Court records indicated that officials had outfitted Abel with a GPS ankle bracelet in order to track his movements. In spite of the authorities' attempts to monitor his whereabouts, Abel reportedly went back to Richardson's house in June of 2020, openly defying the restraining order she had filed against him. Police officers responded to a 911 call placed by Abel himself on the morning of June the 9th. They then took the man back into custody for the alleged murder of his former partner. When officers had arrived at the scene, the victim had already succumbed to the pair of gunshot wounds she had suffered to the head and chest. In his subsequent interviews with detectives, Abel claimed that Richardson's death had been the unintended consequence of a failed attempt to <laughs> Nevertheless, he was formally charged with the woman's murder and held in jail without bond as he awaited his trial. Number 6. Travis Lang On October the 1st of 2021, 24-year-old Dylan McGuinness was gunned down by a man who'd been let out of jail with the help of a non-profit organization called The Bail Project. The perpetrator of the violent crime was Travis Lang, aged 23, who'd been charged with possession of cocaine and three additional felonies in December of 2020. He was held in jail until the following month when he posted his $5,650 bail. It was reported that an unspecified portion of the bail funds had been provided by The Bail Project, an organization founded in 2017 with the expressed purpose of standing bail for detainees who are financially incapable of covering the fees themselves. On the night of October the 1st, Lang had allegedly been part of a drug deal gone wrong in Indianapolis, Indiana. The former inmate had gotten into a dispute with Dylan McGuinness, who'd reportedly accompanied a female friend involved in the exchange of Xanax and heroin with Lang. As tension between the two parties escalated, Lang exited his vehicle and fired several shots into the other car. When emergency responders arrived at the scene at around 11.30 p.m., the woman was transported to the hospital in stable condition, while McGuinness was ultimately pronounced dead as a result of the multiple gunshot wounds he'd sustained. Lang was consequently taken into custody and charged with McGuinness's murder. The victim's mother publicly criticized the bail project for what she described as the organization's support of violent offenders. Number 5. Tiffany Lee The heiress to a Chinese real estate empire was criminally charged following the death of her ex-boyfriend in 2016. Tiffany Lee, also known as the Hillsborough heiress, was taken into custody at her Bay Area mansion in June of 2016, a month after the father of her two children, Keith Green, had been found dead in a Sonoma County field. The last time the victim had been seen alive was at the Millbrae Pancake House, where he'd met with Lee to discuss their ongoing custody battle. The millionaire and her fiancé, Kava Bayett, were charged with Green's murder. Lee's personal trainer, a mixed martial arts fighter named Olivier Adela, had been accused of dumping Green's body after he'd been killed. Adela went on to serve three years in county jail as part of a plea deal in which he'd agreed to testify in court against both Lee and Bayett. The former, who was born into a powerful family worth upwards of 
100 million dollars, spent a total of 10 months in jail before she was eventually released on bail in April of 2017. Her bail had been set at $35 million, reported as being in the top 10 of the highest bail amounts in the history of the United States. After the case had finally made it to trial in September of 2019, Lee was eventually found not guilty of her ex-boyfriend's murder. The San Mateo County District Attorney dropped the charges against Bayet as well after a hung jury had stalled his verdict. In the aftermath of the trial, prosecutors publicly maintained their belief that both Lee and Bayer had played integral roles in Green's murder. The victim's mother subsequently sued the two suspected killers for wrongful death. The civil trial associated with the lawsuit was scheduled to begin in San Mateo Superior Court on January the 31st of 2022. Number 4. Marion Shug Knight In March of 2015, a bail hearing for the former rap mogul Marion Shug Knight took place in the Los Angeles Superior Court. Knight is best known as the co-founder of Death Row Records in the 1990s, whose most prominent artists included Dr. Dre, Tupac Shakur, and Snoop Dogg. Knight had been charged in relation to the murder of his longtime friend and business partner, Terry Carter, in January of 2015. According to eyewitnesses, it followed Carter and filmmaker Clee Sloan to a burger stand parking lot. After the trio had gotten into an argument on the set of the film, Straight Outta Compton, a production based on the rap group N.W.A. As was captured by nearby surveillance cameras, Knight ran over the two victims with his vehicle, killing Carter and seriously injuring Sloan. The music executive appeared before Judge Ronald S. Cohen of the Superior Court on March the 20th. His bail was set at $25 million, an amount that his attorney claimed to be unfair and excessive. Upon hearing the judge's ruling, Knight collapsed in his chair, prompting two sheriff's deputies to rush to his aid. It was reported that Knight had hit his head on the defense table and consequently knocked himself unconscious. His bail was later reduced to $10 million, but Knight's subsequent request for it to be lowered further was denied. He was sentenced to 28 years in federal prison after pleading no contest to a charge of voluntary manslaughter in 2018. Number 3. Samuel Lee Scott a Missouri man was released from jail in April of 2019 after a non-profit group had agreed to stand bail for him. The individual was identified as 54-year-old Samuel Lee Scott, whose initial arrest had stemmed from a domestic violence incident in January, during which he'd allegedly struck his wife, 54-year-old Marcia Johnson. The victim had suffered injuries to her ear and cheekbone, and Scott was formally charged with misdemeanor domestic assault on April the 5th. According to the St. Louis Circuit Attorney's Office, Scott had also threatened to kill his wife because she'd planned to report the attack to the police. Upon his arrest, Scott was served an order of protection that prohibited him from being within 300 feet of his wife or from entering her home. Four days later, the St. Louis chapter of the Bail Project donated the $5,000 that Scott needed in order to post bail. A short time after he'd been granted release, Scott went to his wife's residence where he reportedly beat her until she became unconscious. At 11 p.m. that night, Johnson was rushed to the hospital by a friend who'd found her battered and bloodied in her home, but the woman ultimately succumbed to her extensive injuries a few days later. Scott was taken back into custody and jailed on a $1 million bond after being charged with Johnson's murder. Today's topic was requested by Mentally Void and FN63825. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 1. Robert Durst Texas real estate magnate Robert Durst was arrested in October of 2001 in connection to the killing of his Galveston neighbor, Morris Black. Although Durst was eventually acquitted of Black's murder in November of 2003, the millionaire faced further legal troubles when he was charged with bail jumping and tampering with evidence. The new set of charges reportedly stemmed from Durst's actions as he awaited the start of the trial associated with his neighbor's death. According to court records, Durst had violated the conditions of his bond by leaving the state of Texas after posting his $300,000 bail. Authorities eventually tracked him down to a roadside store in Pennsylvania, where he'd allegedly attempted to steal a sandwich. Following his acquittal in the murder trial, Durst remained in custody in relation to the bail jumping charges. The wealthy businessman subsequently received the largest bail ever set in the United States when State District Judge Susan Chris placed it at $3 billion. Chris had justified 
the exorbitant amount by claiming Durst's previous bail jump improved, he was a legitimate flight risk. In August of 2004, Durst's bail was lowered to just $450,000. Following a hearing in a Texas appeals court, Durst was later sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole after being convicted of an unrelated murder in September of 2021. Seven bounty hunters were arrested following the fatal shooting of Jalen Milan in Clarksville, Tennessee on April the 23rd of 2017. The 24-year-old victim, reported as being the father of three young children, was seated in the back of a sedan that was parked outside a Walmart neighborhood market on the night of the incident. Court records detailed how the suspects, who'd been hired to arrest an individual for skipping out on bond, had approached the vehicle in which Milan sat with their weapons drawn. The bounty hunters then reportedly smashed the car's windows without warning, prompting the driver to speed away from them, believing the car had been ambushed by gang members. The suspects subsequently opened fire on the fleeing car, striking Milan in the back and chest. They then got into their own vehicle and proceeded to pursue the car they'd targeted for a distance of roughly seven miles. A short time after the shooting had occurred, Milan succumbed to his injuries. It was reported that the suspects eventually realized that the individual they'd been searching for wasn't in the vehicle they'd fired upon and consequently abandoned the chase. None of the occupants of the car in which Milan had been shot were wanted on outstanding charges and none of them had been armed, according to subsequent reports. All seven of the bounty hunters involved were initially charged in connection to Milan's death and two of them reportedly reached plea deals with prosecutors in exchange for their testimonies. Following a criminal trial that lasted nearly three weeks, however, the defendants were found not guilty on all counts, except for Joshua Young, aged 28, who was convicted of reckless endangerment with a deadly weapon. Defense attorneys had argued that their clients had simply been acting in self-defense when they opened fire, as the vehicle that contained the victim had struck several of the bounty hunters in the process of fleeing the scene. Number 6. Justin Behag Justin Behag, who regularly appeared on the reality show Dog the Bounty Hunter during the series' first six seasons, was taken into police custody in January of 2020. The 36-year-old bounty hunter was alleged to have violated the terms of his probation, which banned him from using intoxicants of any kind. The court order reportedly stemmed from a past domestic violence charge on which the former television personality had been convicted. Authorities in Edgewater, Colorado, where BHAG resided, had been alerted to the man's alleged probation violations by Lisa Chapman, the daughter of the suspect's former co-star, Dog the Bounty Hunter. BHAG had reportedly engaged in a contentious social media feud with Chapman, roughly a month prior to his arrest. On January the 12th, Edgewater police officers searched BHAG's home where they reportedly found evidence of marijuana use and noted that the man himself smelled strongly of alcohol. It was then that they placed him under arrest. Number 5. Jeremy Hughes A Berkeley County Sheriff's deputy was sent to a local mulch supplier in Monks Corner, South Carolina, on the afternoon of November the 22nd of 2021, after a store employee had contacted the police to report a suspicious person. The responding officer learned that shortly after 12 p.m., a man who'd identified himself as Brian Williams had walked into the store carrying a shotgun and a holstered pistol. He was also described as wearing tactical clothing with a shirt that had the word police printed on the front of it. He claimed to be a US Marshal in search of a man dressed in all orange. The armed individual eventually left the store but then reportedly called the business back a short time later to inform the employees that he'd located the person for whom he'd been looking and told them they could therefore relax. The deputy dispatched to the scene obtained the phone number from which the suspect had called the store. During the ensuing investigation, it emerged that the man who'd claimed to be Brian Williams was actually a convicted felon by the name of Jeremy Hughes, who'd been working as a freelance bounty hunter on the day he entered the mulch store. On December the 1st, the 33-year-old was taken into custody and charged with impersonating a police officer. Number 4. The Lipstick Bounty Hunters in March of 2013, a group of women from Orange County, California, calling themselves the Lipstick Bounty Hunters, assaulted a man whom they were trying to bring into custody. The incident reportedly occurred at an Arby's restaurant in Huntington Beach on the 18th of the month. The women had been in pursuit of 35-year-old Daniel Duval, who'd been released on bond while facing various drug 
and weapons charges. According to the owner of the Lipstick Bounty Hunters Agency, Teresa Galt, she and her crew had been hired to arrest Duval after he'd paid only $1,000 of his $5,000 bail bond. As they were attempting to take the man into custody, Galt and her partners, who were dressed in pink outfits and armed, became involved in a physical altercation with Duval in the parking lot of the restaurant. During the struggle, the women reportedly shot him with a stun gun, pepper spray and rubber bullets, severely injuring one of his eyes in the process. The entire incident was captured on video by Galt herself, who stated that recording the bounty hunter's detention attempts was standard procedure. Duval later filed a lawsuit against the lipstick bounty hunters, claiming that he was no longer able to see out of his right eye due to the women's use of excessive force. Number 3. Dog the Bounty Hunter Reality TV star Dwayne Chapman, who's better known by the alias Dog the Bounty Hunter, was served a $1.3 million defamation lawsuit in 2021, which stemmed from his alleged racist and homophobic behavior while producing the show Dog Unleashed. The accusations of Chapman's misconduct had arisen after the reality series, which had planned to follow the celebrity bounty hunter as he tracked violent fugitives across the United States, was cancelled mere weeks before it was scheduled to premiere. As detailed in the lawsuit filed by the president and CEO of Unleashed Entertainment, Michael Donovan, Chapman's actions during production breached contractual agreements. The 68-year-old had allegedly used racially charged language in reference to Black Lives Matter activists and had also made several offhand comments deemed homophobic about an openly gay man. The lawsuit further claimed that the investigation into Chapman's alleged impropriety discovered that he'd illegally holstered a taser while filming an episode of the show in Virginia. As per state law, individuals convicted of a violent crime are prohibited from carrying a device such as the one referenced in the lawsuit. Chapman had previously been convicted of first-degree murder in 1976 and his possession of the taser was therefore considered illegal in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Chapman claimed the lawsuit malicious and bogus, while stating his intentions to pursue retaliatory legal action against Donovan. Number 2. Matador Recovery On the night of February 8, 2021, three bounty hunters from the bail bonding company Matador Recovery descended on a house in a residential neighborhood of Nashville, Tennessee, which they believed belonged to a man they'd been tracking. According to a police report, the three suspects broke down the front door and charged inside before holding the homeowner, Lavaris Coma, and his 16-year-old son at gunpoint. They claimed to be looking for a man named Tavaris, who'd allegedly failed to show up for a scheduled court appearance. After forcing their way into the residence, the bounty hunters reportedly knocked Coma to the ground and continued to point their weapons at him and the teenager while ignoring their insistence that the individual they were searching for wasn't there. The armed men, one of whom was later identified as the owner of Matador Recovery, 51-year-old Khalil Abdullah, initially didn't believe Coma's claims of innocence. However, they eventually realized that they'd entered the wrong house and promptly fled the scene. Coma contacted Nashville police to report the incident and was able to provide the authorities with the suspect's license plate number. Roughly two months later, Abdullah was positively identified by the authorities and taken into custody. He was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and aggravated criminal trespass. It emerged that Abdullah had previously been arrested in 2014. His detainment had been related to an incident in which he'd allegedly broken into a woman's home in search of her husband who was accused of not showing up to court for a traffic infraction. The two other bounty hunters involved in the ambush of Coma's residence had not yet been identified, as per the latest updates on the case. Number 1. Fabian Hector Herrera On April 23, 2021, bounty hunter Fabian Hector Herrera was sent to a condo unit in Palm Springs, California, to arrest a man named David Spann, Herrera had been hired by Justice Bail Bonds of Temecula after Spann had allegedly violated the terms of his bail bond by disabling the electronic monitoring device he'd been required to wear. The bounty hunter reportedly contacted Palm Springs police just before 2 a.m. to let them know he was about to take Spann into custody. 
Shortly thereafter, he was captured by the latter's doorbell security camera fruitlessly attempted to kick open the front door to his condo. Herrera, who was accompanied by his mother, Lisa Vargas, eventually gained access to the residence by breaking down the door with a sledgehammer. The bounty hunter subsequently called the police a second time to report that he was holding Span at gunpoint and was in need of support. Two Palm Springs police officers arrived at the scene minutes later. Span, who was wielding a knife, demanded that Herrera and the officers leave immediately, but one of the policemen then reportedly deployed his taser, causing the homeowner to stumble backwards. The officers retreated, but Herrera proceeded to fire a single gunshot at Span, killing him instantly. Following the shooting, the officers arrested the bounty hunter and he was consequently charged with murder. It would later emerge that Herrera wasn't actually a licensed bail agent, but a twice convicted felon. He thus wasn't allowed to carry the firearm that he ultimately used to gun down Span that night. In the wake of this discovery, Herrera faced further charges of felon in possession of a gun, body armor, and ammunition. In November of 2021, he entered a plea of not guilty and his trial readiness conference was scheduled for February the 3rd of 2022. Thanks for watching.